What do we know about James Buchanan? James Buchanan, the 15th President of the United States. Well, let's see. He was the only, pen, uh, the only president from Pennsylvania. So anyone from Pennsylvania here, we can take pride in that, maybe. He was the only, um, you might have read about the state dinner that was held yesterday, I guess, in Washington by President Obama for the visiting president of France, Hollande, who's amazingly short, I noticed in the papers, but that's irrelevant. Um, <laughs> And the, the, the problem that he had just split up with his uh, non-wife, who he'd been living with because he'd been found going on a motor scooter to visit an actress, et cetera, you know, vive la France. But anyway, um, and the whole problem of who was going to sit where, and they, he, well, anyway, so, but James Buchanan had the same problem because he was the only bachelor or unmarried president. So there were always these kinds of issues when he was holding dinners at the White House. Um, a magazine wrote an article not long ago that he was actually gay, the only gay president. So maybe that's true, I don't know. The evidence was weak. Um, Buchanan was nearsighted in one eye and farsighted in the other eye and only <laughs> discovered this in middle age, so he wasn't very self-reflective. Um, <laughs> My predecessor, Professor James Shenton, a great teacher here a generation ago who taught this course, once had a student who, instead of a term paper, convinced Shenton that he could, to fulfill the requirements of the course, he choreographed a modern dance work called James Buchanan and the Secession Crisis. And let's see, John Updike, if you ever read John Updike's novel, Memoirs of the Ford Administration, uh, actually, it has nothing to do with the Ford administration. The protagonist is a historian who's trying to write a biography of James Buchanan, and his marital difficulties keep getting in the way of completing this book. So that's it. And also, in the game that historians frequently play of ranking the presidents, um, James Buchanan always ends up at the very bottom or next to the bottom. He's sort of considered by historians the worst or almost the worst president, okay? So that's, let's start out with all that for about James Buchanan. Now, one, oh, one more thing. Um, here is a mural of James Buchanan. And who's that standing in front of the mural? That is me. It is, it is. That's a picture of me and a good friend of mine, Professor Catherine Clinton, a distinguished scholar of Southern history. So where is this? Who can figure out where this is? Thank you. Who said that? Absolutely. Belfast. How did you know that? Are you from Belfast? No, no, I've seen it before. You've seen it? Really? Amazing. All right. Anyway, all right, he's right. <laughs> Belfast. He's absolutely right. Belfast, Northern Ireland. As you may know, for decades, centuries, I don't know, for decades anyway, Catholic and Protestant residents, of citizens of Northern Ireland were killing each other in large numbers. Um, about 10, 12 years ago, they reached a peace treaty, and now they are fighting through historical murals, which is a much more peaceful way of doing it. So throughout Nor Belfast, there are mur historical murals to sort of with, if, if you want to talk about different points of view about history, you can see it in these murals. So this is from the Protestant area where, why do they have James Buchanan? Well, James Buchanan apparently is Scotch-Irish in ancestry, so some of his ancestors came from Northern Ireland, and it's, you know, it's good to have a mural of a local boy who made good, so to speak, in America. Uh, and, but of course, the blood is uh, this. This is this. You know, the blood is heritage is the most important thing. Is ancestry. Now, when I saw this, and I had to explain to the people who were taking me around with great pride that James Buchanan is universally considered the worst president in American history, <laughs> and that indeed <clears throat> there is no mural of James Buchanan in Pennsylvania, where he came from, uh, they were kind of chagrined to hear that. So. Um, but anyway, in Northern Ireland, he's, he's a big hero. So, um, all right, let, so uh, what happened under the presidency of James Buchanan? Well, this is the period of the final dissolution of the political system and the nation. <laughs> Other than that, not much happened. But um, 
And you know, all the major, the political institutions, the courts, the Congress, the president, all failed to solve the growing crisis. Um, if you want to see the Civil War as the product of a blundering generation, you can find plenty of evidence in the administration of President, in that period of the administration of President Buchanan. Of course, one can ask, was it a blundering generation or was the crisis unresolvable? That is, was it incapable of solution? That's one of the things we'll have to try to figure out. But Buchanan was a perfect product of the old political system. He had, his life was coterminous with it. He was born during George Washington's first administration. So he lived through the entire history of the nation, virtually up to the Civil War. He had been a Federalist. He'd been a Jacksonian. He had served in just about every office you can, uh, from local office to the state legislature in Pennsylvania to the House of Representatives and the Senate. He was Secretary of State under James K. Polk. He was an ambassador in Europe. And he was a, pres a perennial presidential sort of hopeful. Buchanan never lost an election. In other words, whatever one thinks of him, he was not just a fumbling politician. He was, uh, a, he was not politically unsophisticated. He, he rose through the system and he did very well as a product of that political system. He was nominated by, by the Democrats uh, to run for president uh, in 1856, as we have said on a platform committed to popular sovereignty, letting the people of the territories decide for themselves whether they want slavery or not. That was the Democratic Party position. And supporting the Kansas-Nebraska bill. This, of course, was the position and the bill of Stephen A. Douglas. But while the party embraced the policies of, Se of Senator Douglas, they didn't want Douglas himself. He tried again for the presidential nomination in 1856, although he was only 43 years old, still pretty young, but he was far too controversial because of his role in that bill. Um, and so to unite the party, uh, a man was chosen who had nothing to do with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, Buchanan had been in uh, Europe um, as ambassador in, uh, uh, while the Kansas-Nebraska bill was being uh, uh, passed through, through Congress. He had nothing to do with it. Um, it, there is some evidence that Buchanan promised Douglas that he would only serve one term and Douglas could get the presidential nomination four years later when he still was young in uh, 1860. Now, as we saw last time, uh, Buchanan was elected uh, in a very sectionally polarized election, by and large, that the Republican Party swept the upper north but Buchanan succeeded in carrying the entire South and the key states of what we call the Lower North, Pennsylvania, Indiana, uh, Illinois, um, and that the election of 1856 really put on the agenda politically what would happen to those sort of conservative voters, the, who, the old Whig voters in the Lower North who had mostly voted for Fillmore, the, the know-nothing candidate, because they didn't like the Republicans and they didn't like the Democrats either, what would happen to them uh, in the next elections? Because they were a swing group and their party, the know-nothings, was disintegrating. Um, now, um, so that the strength of the Republican Party should have put a premium on unity within the Democratic Party. But very quickly under Buchanan, the unity of the Democratic Party falls apart, as we will see in a minute. So Buchanan was, as I say, a, a traditional politician, a believer in the union, a believer in the political system, a believer in law and order and precedent, et cetera. And he believed, as so many politicians had, that the slavery issue could and should be kept out of politics, that somehow it should be just pushed to the side. And he saw his role as kind of pacifying the, um, the emotions, the sectional sentiments and emotions that had flared up over the past few years. But the problem with Buchanan was, among other things, that he, he was a very weak person, really. He lacked resolution. 
he tended to avoid difficult decisions. He could easily be bullied, and, um, and he was throughout his, uh, his presidency. And he quickly fell under the control of Southerners, extreme Southerners, in his cabinet. He, he, his uh, making of his cabinet was a strange process. He completely ignored Douglas, the leading figure in the party, or anybody associated with Douglas. The only person from the Northwest he put in his cabinet was Lewis Cass, who was very old and somewhat senile, and uh, as Secretary of State, and uh, had very little influence. The most important people in the cabinet were, as I say, almost secessionist by this time. Uh, Jeff uh, um, no, not Jefferson Davis, but uh, Tom, uh, a guy named Thompson of Mississippi, who was a sidekick of Jefferson Davis. The Senator Howell Cobb of Georgia was in there. One of the largest slave owners, uh, Cobb was one of only 14 people in the entire South who owned more than 500 slaves. And he was put in there as Secretary of the Treasury, so he's obviously represented the most extreme pro-slavery point of view. The Secretary of War was from Virginia. It was very much a pro-Southern a pro uh, uh, um, uh, a cabinet. The only counterbalance was the Attorney General, Jeremiah Black, who was from Pennsylvania and a friend of Buchanan's and a very strong, and not a Republican obviously, but a strong Unionist and opponent of any talk of uh, secession. 